Welcome to the Unit 6 Recorded Study Guide. In this unit, we look at the beginning of our nation, and it's kind of this transitional period after the Revolutionary War and after the Constitution has been created, and uh, seeing how the Constitution functions, how the country functions underneath the Constitution, who's going to lead the country, and the problems that we run into along the way, and then also in the later part of the unit, how we grow, expand, and have other conflicts with other nations. We start with uh, George Washington, it's the first thing on your study guide, and he can be found on page 314. Um, when we talk about George Washington in this unit, we're um, talking about his presidency and how he was uh, chosen to be the first president of the United States. And there are some things that he does that um, every president after him will do because, you know, they're like, hey, George Washington did it. I should do it, too. One of those things is, uh, you know, calling the president Mr. President um, later on when we get to when he retires from office, the two terms, that's kind of a tradition that is most of the time followed. Uh, and then the other one that's a very important one in this unit is the president's cabinet. The president's cabinet is talked about and outlined on page 314 as well. Um, this is just a little drawing of what maybe the first cabinet would have uh, looked like. You had four main departments. Um, State, the State Department, the Treasury Department, the Department of War, and um, the Department of Justice. So, think of, the way we uh, talk about it in my class is um, the President's Cabinet basically just helps him do all the things that he needs to do uh, running the country. And it's very similar to if you were put in charge of, say, a major corporation like McDonald's. So, this is you, this little line. Like, if you were in charge of McDonald's, you would have a lot of things that you would need to take care of. Like, for example, you know, uh, getting all the food, the uh, construction of new buildings, employment, all this kind of stuff. Uh, well, that's like a lot of stuff for one person to take care of. So you would maybe hire a person to be in charge of each of those areas. And then each of these people would make up your uh, cabinet. So that's kind of what the president does. The president has little areas that, you know, he has to take care of. So Department of State, which the State Department is, they deal with relations with other nations. The Treasury Department, uh, which deals with the nation's economy. The Justice Department, legal matters. And then the Department of War, which has to do with war. And it's called defense now, so it's like defending ourselves from war or stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, Thomas Jefferson was the first Secretary of State. Uh, Henry Knox, who is the next guy on your study guide, is the first uh, Secretary of War, and that's also on page 314. I keep writing the one first. That's, I'm going to stop doing that. Um, th another member of the cabinet was Alexander Hamilton. That's this guy right here. You've probably seen him on the $10 bill. This is on page uh, 316. Uh, Alexander Hamilton is the first Secretary of the Treasury, and his one of his main goals is to pay off the war debt. Um, and in order to, he wants to do that because he knows that if we don't pay off our war debt, we won't be able to take, or another, no other country will be able to take us seriously. So he wants to pay that off so we can do business with other countries, kind of succeed as a country. Um, well, comes up with this plan. Uh, it's kind of got three parts. The first one is just basically pay off the debt, combine all the debt from all the different states, put it into one lump, and uh, pay it all off together. Uh, pay off the debt. To do that, he wants to uh, increase the revenue of the government, and um, we're, to do that, he favors tariffs. 
Tariffs are ta taxes on imported goods, so you need to know that tariffs are taxes on imported goods. So basically, if you've got two products, um, one from a United States company and one from a whoa, British company, they put theirs in a different box apparently, um, and both of these have the same amount of things in them, and, like say it's like a box of tobacco, um, and one has... One has the same amount as the other. It's all the same. Um, they each would sell for ten dollars a box, but with an with a tariff because this one from Britain is coming from Britain and being imported. There's going to be like a thirty percent tax on it. So now it's going to be thirteen dollars instead of ten dollars. So what that does is makes this ten dollars the U.S. good and ten dollars, and then this thirteen dollars. So more people are going to buy this one from the United States company. So that means that the United States company is going to grow, prosper. Um, and then have to pay more taxes, hire more people, so those people can pay more taxes, and that's just going to create more revenue for the government. Revenue is just money that the government makes, and the government makes money off of taxes, so putting tariffs on things increases the chances of them collecting taxes. The last thing that he wants to do is create a national bank, and this is the first time that we see this argument that kind of is a big theme throughout the whole entire unit, and it has to do with uh, the interpretations or views of the Constitution. So Hamilton has a loose view of the Constitution. Um, other people like James Madison and Thomas Jefferson have a strict view of the Constitution. So. The way that I describe this in my class is, okay, let's say that you have a number line. You have one, two, three, four, and five. If you have a strict view of that number line, there are only five numbers there. You have one, two, three, four, and five. Therefore, that's the only numbers, those are the only numbers that you can use. That's a strict interpretation. No reading between the lines. What's there is there. That's it. If you have a loose interpretation of that number line, I could say that, well, in between 1 and 2 is 1.5. In between 2 and 3 is 2.6. If I have these two numbers that are close to each other, you know, I can combine them. Maybe that kind of looks like 34. This kind of looks like 45. So now what we're doing is we're reading between the lines, and that gives us more options. We can do this. We can have 2.6. We have 34. We have 3. We have 4. We have 45. We have 5. So there's just a million different options now because we're looking at this with kind of a more loose interpretation. We have different options, so things tend to... Uh, expand when that happens. So if you have, again, when you have a strict interpretation, you just have one, two, three, four, five. What's there is there, that's it. Loose interpretation, you're reading between the lines a little bit. So Hamilton is reading between the lines a little bit of the Constitution. All right, so he has a loose interpretation of the Constitution, which when he reads it, he reads between the lines, he finds ways to kind of make it say what he wants to say and use that. And um, one of those things is a, the National Bank. People like Thomas Jefferson, who have a strict view of the Constitution, would say, there's nothing in the Constitution that says anything about a national bank, so you can't do it. That's the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. None of those numbers have anything to do with a national bank, so you can't do it. Alexander Hamilton, on the other hand, would say, well, in between here, you can kind of see that it says that we can do this, and that's a loose interpretation of the Constitution. This is going to be an argument throughout the rest of the unit. It's going to be a big dividing point in between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. You have to understand this concept to understand a lot of the stuff that's going to follow in this unit. So if you don't understand this, make sure that you ask somebody about it. You ask one of your teacher, you ask somebody else that has an understanding of it in class. Whatever you need to do, if you don't, if you don't understand it, you got to make sure you do. Um, so basically... What happens is we move on from there to look at problems that the country is facing um, both at home and abroad, meaning um, meaning away, like uh, outside of our country. So the first one we look at 
is the Whiskey Rebellion. That happens at home. It's a, it's a big issue that George Washington has to deal with. The Whiskey Rebellion can be found on page 321. Basically what happens is Hamilton, once again in ha Hamilton's plan, he wants to pay off debt, he wants to increase revenue, he puts a tax on whiskey, okay? Well, the farmers in the backcountry that are, you know, producing whiskey don't like that because that makes it more expensive for them to uh, produce and sell and that makes them less money. So they say, well, we're not going to follow that tax and we're going to rebel. Well, George Washington says, well, I'm the president now, um, we have an executive branch and we are going to enforce the law. And if you don't want to follow it, then too bad. We're going to make you follow the law. So he sends 20,000 troops over, scares the crap out of these farmers. They run away, they capture some of them, and uh, the rebellion is put down. This is important because it shows that under the Constitution, the executive branch and the government can actually enforce the laws that it makes. Unlike under the Articles of Confederation, where Shays' Rebellion just kind of took off and they couldn't do anything about it. Um, problems that we're having with other countries, um, it, at this time, the first instance of the French and the British fighting um, during Washington's presidency over kind of the French Revolution, uh, they're fighting and they're trying to drag us into the middle. Well, the, at, they start capturing our ships and um, the British do this first and we want to try to work this out peacefully so George Washington sends this guy John Jay who is this guy up in here, this picture right here not the Cardinals player this guy he's going to be the first Supreme Court Justice but John Jay goes to Britain and tries to work out a peace treaty and um, he is successful in doing two things one is that he wants to get this peace treaty signed so they will stop taking our ships in the Atlantic Ocean. But also, he wants to get uh, them kind of out of the the Northwest Territory. The British still have forts kind of in this area, right up in here, and they are causing a lot of trouble for our settlers. So they get this treaty signed, and now they kind of leave this area. They leave our settlers alone which is good, and it basically sets our border. Well, our border is already this, but it, it gives us less trouble now. We don't have to worry about anybody out here. So now, you know, the frontier is safe, and we can focus more on expanding and growing as a nation. The same thing kind of having, happens with Pinckney's treaty, but the things that you have to understand is that with Jay's treaty, first of all, both of these are on page 323 but you have to understand that this one is with the British and then um, Pinckney's treaty is with Spain Jay's treaty settles things in our frontier over the British fighting that and then Pinckney's treaty what that does is uh, it settles some things with us being able to use the Mississippi River it um, s settles this border with Florida, so we're not fighting over that any longer. So now we have very set boundaries, and we can use the Mississippi River and the Port of New Orleans to trade and travel. And now we don't really have to worry so much about other countries and the disputes that we're having with them, because that's what both of these treaties do. Both of these treaties are successful settling conflicts on our frontier. So with those conflicts settled, settled settled and uh, problems kind of going away we see a new problem arise and that is with the fact that George Washington is going to retire and that's a problem not because you know we don't you know he's just gonna leave it's because you know he's always been there to help us through you know figuring everything out this is all this outlines on page uh, 328. It kind of talks about things that he advises against, like political parties. He doesn't think that political parties are a good idea, uh, mainly because he feels that if everybody's on one side or the other, that's just going to split America in two, and then no one will be working together for a common goal. They'll just be fighting back and forth. So, I mean, that's crazy, right? Okay, so... um. He also advises against having permanent 
uh, treaties and relationships with other countries because he doesn't want to get dragged. You never know what will happen. So he says, you know, what might be good today might not be good tomorrow. So steer clear of that. So anyway, he retires and, you know, we have to figure out who's going to be president. So he's like, hey, don't have don't have political parties. It's a bad idea. Well, the election of 1796 it's so also on page 328. It's the first election, the first presidential election, where political parties compete. So they didn't listen to him at all. Um, those two political parties are the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Now, this picture that I'm showing you is not in your book, but something very similar to it is on page 329. So that's a 9. Okay, so 329 for both of these guys. And it's going to give you all the information that you need about Federalists and Democratic Republicans. The first thing that you need to remember is who's leading what which group. And the Federalists are being led by Hamilton and Adams, John Adams. And then the Democratic Republicans, that's Jefferson and Madison. Okay. The big key difference is what we just talked about earlier with the loose and the strict interpretation of the Constitution. Federalists have a loose interpretation. Democratic Republicans have a strict. If you remember, a loose interpretation, you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If you read between the lines, you've got 1.5, 2.6, 34, 45. So you have a lot of different options, which means that the government can do more things, which means that it will be bigger. So the government will get bigger, and the Federalists want a strong, big national government. Democratic Republicans, on the other hand, you know, they've got their little number line one, two, three, four, five, and that's it. Those are your only options. So it's going to be smaller a smaller government so those are the big main issues that they struggle with because everything that they fight about kind of grows from that disagreement but uh, you know one side favors the French Revolution the Democratic Republicans like the French at first they like the French Revolution they want to support them the Federalists do not and uh, they do not want the French Revolution to go on because Hamilton's like hey we can't support the French because if we support the French, we'll go against the British. If we go against the British, we won't be able to trade. If we can't trade, we can't pay off our war debt. Jefferson's like, hey, we have to support the French. Doesn't matter because they're like fighting for freedom and all this stuff. So, yeah. All right. Well, so these are the two first two political parties. And in the end, in the election of 1796, John Adams comes out victorious. And so John Adams, which we're looking at that... Page 329 as well. He becomes the second president of the United States, and he runs into some issues as well when he is president. One of those issues has to deal with France, and um, the French are doing the same thing that the British were doing, which is capturing our ships and, you know, causing us a lot of trouble. So John Adams, of course, doesn't want to go to war over this. He wants to work things out. So just like we did with Jay's treaty, we're hoping to send somebody over to France, have a conversation, work out a peace treaty. Unfortunately, that doesn't really all work out because what happens is the XYZ affair. This whole story can be found starting on page 329, goes through page 330. So John Adams sends three guys over to France. They're supposed to meet up with these other French guys to have a little conversation about peace talks and, you know, that's how it works. And they'll say, okay, we'll give you this if, you know, you give us this and stop taking our ships and then they'll write up a treaty and then it'll be good. But what happens is before they can even have those peace talks, these French agents, who they refer to as X, Y, and Z, um, like code names, I guess, whatever. Um, they pull them aside and they're like, hey, before you even get to go to that stage to have any sort of peace talks, you've got to give us $10 million, like a loan, $10 million loan right now, and then you also got to give us $250 cash bribe, which is like something that they won't 
pay it back. They just want the money because they're trying to get a bribe, and that's what they want. So this kind of all explodes back in the United States because everybody's like, oh my gosh, the French tried to bribe us, and we don't like that, and that's stupid. So the, these guys go back to the United States. They tell John Adams. It kind of gets a, to a big, a big deal. And the Federalists use this to gain more political power because the Federalists say, oh, look at the stupid Democratic Republicans. They were, like, wanting the French to... We want, They wanted to be nice to the French and everything. Well, that's stupid. Aren't they stupid for thinking that stupid thing? So you shouldn't vote for them anymore. You should vote for the Federalists. And that's what happens. And a lot of people vote for the Federalists, and the Federalists gain a lot of power. And because they gain a lot of power, they can, do, they can pass some laws that uh, might not be necessarily in the best interest of everybody involved. So one of that uh, one of those things that we look at is the Alien and Sedition Acts. That is going to be on page 331. Um, basically the Alien and Sedition Acts, the whole idea is that they're going to pass these laws to stop immigrants and other people from talking bad about the Federalists and causing problems. That's how they, they sell it as Oh, we'll pass this law, and the immigrants and some of the people that are causing all these problems for us, they'll have to stop, and then our country will be able to succeed. Well, really what it does is it limits a lot of free speech and freedom of the press, and that kind of doesn't go over well with too many people. So even though they're very popular, this kind of shifts things, because once you start taking rights away from people, uh, they aren't too thrilled. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison both try to get rid of the um, Alien and Sedition Acts by introducing the Kentucky and Virginia proposals. This is on page 331 through 332. Uh, this introduces the idea of states' rights, which is the idea that the state has the right to overturn or nullify, which means to kind of like cancel out, an act of Congress. So what they're saying is if a state doesn't like for example, the Alien and Sedition Acts, the state has the right to vote and then remove it and not have to follow it within that state. This is the first time that this idea of states' rights is introduced. It will become a bigger deal later on because Kentucky and Virginia proposals do not work. They do not get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, but it's very important because it does introduce the idea of states' rights, the right or the idea that the state has the right to overturn an act of the national government. Um, it doesn't really matter that the Kentucky and Virginia proposals don't get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts because within like the next two years, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, the ones that wanted to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, they're going to be the ones in power anyway, so they get rid of it on their own, which, funny enough, brings us to the next thing on your city guide, which is the election of 1800. So the election of 1800 is um, interesting. It is a little different because the election of 1800, the Democratic Republicans want Thomas Jefferson to be president, and they don't want John Adams to be president, and they also don't want John Adams to be vice president. The way this is set up is that in a presidential election at this time, when whoever got second became vice president. So that's how Thomas Jefferson became vice president under John Adams. And um, that's what they don't want to happen this time around. They don't want John Adams to be vice president. So a lot of the Democratic Republicans vote for Thomas Jefferson, but they also vote for another guy named Aaron Burr. And it ends up being a tie. And it's this big, long ordeal because they vote like a whole bunch more times in the House of Representatives. But eventually, Thomas Jefferson becomes president, and that's what we're going to focus on here. So if you, wanna, if you need to look at that and remind yourself of the election of 1800, it's on page 339. But we're going to start talking about Thomas Jefferson. He's the third president of the United States. It's this guy right here. Um, so, yeah. One of the big things that happens during the early part of his term, or his first term, is Marbury versus Madison. Because if you remember, Thomas Jefferson is a Democratic Republican. He has a strict view of the Constitution. 
Uh, you know, it's just a sm one, the number line, one, two, three, four, five. No reading between the lines. And that means that he wants a smaller government. So he's trying to shrink the size of the government, reduce the number of employees, the federal employees. The one part that he can't control, however, is the courts. And what he's trying to do is prevent more federalists from becoming judges. And um, this is happening. A lot of federalists are becoming judges because John Adams, at the end of his presidency, put a lot of um, judges into place, and he chose people that were Federalists. So the idea is that if you if you are nominated to be a judge, you get this piece of paper, and then you're appointed, and then you become a judge. If you don't get the piece of paper, it's not like you've never really actually been appointed. So Thomas Jefferson says, hey, don't deliver this piece of paper to this guy named John Marshall. It's, John, it's uh, James Madison's job to do this. So he doesn't deliver the paper, and John Marshall says, hey, you have to deliver that to me. I'm going to take you to court. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And this is that Supreme Court case uh, known as Marbury versus Madison. It's on 342. This is uh, John Marshall. This is James Madison. So basically what Marshall is saying is that, hey, that's... I need to be, I should be appointed judge, give me the piece of paper, it's the Supreme Court's power to decide this. It's their power because Congress gave them this power under this Judiciary Act. Well, the Supreme Court looks at it and goes, well, they might have given us this power under this Judiciary Act, but actually, they can't do that. So that Judiciary Act is invalid. It's unconstitutional. So that law is thrown out. So we can't help you, but our decision is that that law is unconstitutional and has to be removed. So it's the first time that the Supreme Court actually declared something unconstitutional, went back and looked at a law and decided, hey, that's not right, we got to get rid of it. It's the idea of judicial review, and that's set up by Marbury versus Madison. Uh, the other big thing that happens during Thomas Jefferson's presidency, of course, is the Louisiana Purchase. This starts on page 345. Um, when Americans talked about the West in the 1800s, they were really talking about everything up to the Mississippi River. Not all this stuff out here, just the Mississippi River. So what we're doing is we're trading a lot on the Mississippi River. But the Spanish shut off New Orleans to us, so we can't get out into the Gulf of Mexico. And then they give that territory to the French, and then we're mad at the French for not letting us. And then Thomas Jefferson's like, hey, I'll solve this. I'll just buy this little port of New Orleans, and uh, we'll control that port. And then that means that we can travel up and down the river, and nobody will give us any problems. Well, France, this is the French flag. They control Louisiana territory right now. They need money. Napoleon is the leader of France. He's fighting Britain, and he needs money, and he doesn't really need all this land in North America. What he needs is cash. And instead of saying, oh, yeah, you can buy the port of New Orleans, the little town, um, how about instead you buy the entire 5 million acres of the Louisiana Purchase or the Louisiana Territory? Thomas Jefferson loves this idea Sort of. He wants a nation of farmers because he's a democratic republican and farmers need land. But on the, same, on the same side of that is that he is a democratic republican who has a strict view of the constitution. And because the constitution says nothing about the president being able to purchase land, he is very unsure if he should do so. But the good outweighs the bad for him. So he purchases the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million from France. And now we have to figure out what's out there. And that comes to this part of the story that you probably all mostly know about, which is like Lewis and Clark, um, Corpse, uh, the Corps of Discovery. And this is, this is page 346 and through 349. Basically, everything about Lewis and Clark is through there. Um, this is Lewis and Clark here, staring off into the distance, pointing at something. Who knows? Um, he's saying, yes, Clark, we will go that way to see stuff. Anyway, all right, um, so they don't know what's out there. They need to explore their goals here. They're trying to find an all-water route. That doesn't happen because they get through the Missouri River. They run to the Rocky Mountains. It's about the part of the Rocky Mountains when they run into Sacagawea, um, who's also on your study guide. She's important because uh, she shows 
other Native American tribes that this is not like a war party that they're traveling with because females didn't travel with war parties. So like it's Lewis and Clark and a whole bunch of like 40 other guys and then Sacagawea. So they, instead of Native American tribes seeing them and going, oh no, we have to fight, um, they see that, you know, she's with her child and, you know, it's not, they're just here in peace. They're just trying to work some things out. So uh, they get through the Rocky Mountains with her help and um, go through the Columbia River and then eventually to where he's pointing, off into the Pacific Ocean. Anyway, uh, Meriwether Lewis was chosen to lead the expedition. Uh, he is Jefferson's personal secretary, so um, Thomas Jefferson knew him very well. He knew he was a smart guy, and uh, he chose him to go out there. Lewis chooses William Clark, who is an outdoorsman and a map maker which is another one of their goals, uh, make a reliable map, which they do. Um, so he's an outdoorsman, a map maker. Lewis is the personal secretary. Kind of need to know the difference between the two. Um, yeah. Sacagawea talked about her. So that is the northern part of the Louisiana Territory. Let me just uh, bring this down here real quick. The southern part was explored by a guy named Zebulon Pike. Awesome name. Um... This is on page 349. Zebulon Pike went through the southern part of the Louisiana Territory, went through Kansas, Colorado, went down, got in a little bit of trouble here, uh, got captured, put in Spanish prison, and uh, yeah, he goes through Colorado, climbs uh, a mountain, it's going to be named after him, Pike's Peak, get it, Pike's, yeah, okay, um, so yeah, that's the southern part. Uh, now we kind of have all that area, we know what's going on, and our country just doubled in size, so that's exciting. So now we run into some problems with Britain, um, outside of our country, abroad. We had settled things with the British with the Jay's Treaty, but then they start taking our ships again, and not only are they taking their sh our ships, but they are practicing this thing called impressment, which is on page 354. Impressment is um, where not only do they take our ships, they take the people on the ships, and then they make them fight for the British against the French, because the British and the French are still fighting. Ugh, yeah, okay, so they're, they're fighting. That gets Americans really, really angry at the British. I mean, it's one thing to take our ships, but it's another thing to capture our people and make them fight. Um, another thing that the B British do that kind of makes the Americans mad has to do with this guy named Tecumseh. He's a Native American chief. This whole story is on page 354 as well. He wants to unify um, Native American tribes to fight and um, protect their land from the white settlers. And what actually is happening is he's kind of, him and Native Americans are getting support from the British because they're getting support from the British, the Americans don't like this, obviously, and they don't like the British even more. So, all of these things are happening. Like, they're using impressment, they're helping the Native Americans. Um, and Thomas Jefferson doesn't want to go to war, because Thomas Jefferson's, you know, like, you know, small government, not a big deal, let's work things out peacefully, peace, yeah, okay, anyway. Um, he, uh... He works it. He tries to work this out with the Embargo Act of 1807. This is on page 354 as well. Basically, this says no more trade. We are not going to trade with foreign nations until Britain and France stop taking our ships, stop um, helping Native Americans, stop pushing us around. And Thomas Jefferson's like, yeah, that's going to work. But no, it doesn't because it's really bad because really what it does is it uh, ends up hurting American farmers and Americans more because the British and French they go find other places to buy stuff we don't we can't trade anymore because of the embargo act of 1807 so all these people lose a whole bunch of money so this all happens people are really angry at the British and eventually we go to war. James Madison is elected president um, in 1808, and things escalate even more, and they declare war on Britain in um, the summer of 1812, thus 
that's why the war is named the War of 1812. So, the War of 1812, those are kind of the causes. The war is broken up into two parts. There's the first phase. Um, the first phase is marked because the British are fighting both the Americans in, the, in um, North America and the French in Europe. Not, we're not working with the French, but they are fighting both of us at the same time. During that first part of the war, we have some naval success in Lake Erie. Um, this is on page... 356 with Oliver Hazard Perry. He is a big naval officer. He beats some British guys and pushes them, makes them retreat back to Canada. So that's great. The second phase of the war starts when the British have actually defeated the British, or <laughs> the British have actually defeated the French, and now they have all their resources and power to focus on us. They come in and they burn down the White House, they march on to another fort. Um, Fort McHenry in Baltimore, and this is where, like, you know, the rocket's red glare and the, the bombs bursting in air and the flag and stuff was still there. So that's, like, the Star-Spangled Banner. That's that's during this war that that's written. Um, Francis Scott Key and... Yeah. Okay. So the British are having some success in the north, but the Americans are also having some sex... Some sec the British are having some success in the north, but also the Americans are having success as well. So really it's kind of at a stalemate, and this goes on for about three years. And then in uh, 1815, January of 1815, the Battle of New Orleans takes place. Battle of New Orleans is important because it's a major victory for the Americans. And um, what ends up happening is the British are just kind of funneling into the Gulf. Um, the Americans scrape together a little army led by this guy right here. You might have seen him on the $20 bill, Andrew Jackson. He is going to become a war hero because of this battle. Because in the Battle of New Orleans, the British suffer 2,000 casualties, and the Americans only suffer 71. So because of this, it's a huge victory for the Americans. A big morale booster, and we're like, hey, we're America, and we can do awesome stuff, and Andrew Jackson's awesome and great. But uh, Battle of New Orleans is important because of those reasons, but... It doesn't have any effect on the war, because the Treaty of Ghent is the treaty that ended the war of 1812, and it actually happened. It was signed before the Battle of New Orleans, and because of slow mail delivery, Andrew Jackson and the British people and all the American troops and everybody, they didn't know that the war was over, so they continued to fight this battle, and 2,000 British people died, and the 71 American people died, and... Um, all for nothing, because the war was already over. So the Treaty of Ghent can be found on page 358, and that's the treaty that ends the war of 1812. Um, this is a picture of them signing it, or something. Um, the legacy of the War of 1812, very important, also on page 358. There's a great paragraph that describes exactly what the legacy of the war is. Um, it increases patriotism and optimism for the new nation and the fact that maybe we can stand up and fight and be equals with Britain and other nations. Stop referring to ourselves as, like, I'm from New York, or I'm from Maine, or I'm from Massachusetts, but, like, saying, oh, I'm from America. Like, I'm an American. I'm from the United States. The other thing is, during the War of 1812, we could not trade. Because we cannot trade, if we want something that we don't have, we have to figure out how to make it or manufacture it. So, like, for example, if you were out, this is kind of like this situation, if you were out in the wilderness for eight months and you couldn't go to the store to buy clothes or shoes you would have to figure out how to make clothes and shoes if yours worn out, got worn out. By the end of that eight months, you would be very good at repairing and making shoes or sewing or clothes or whatever. That's what happens to America. We are unable to go buy things or get things finished goods, so during the War of 1812, we have to figure out how to make them. By the end of the war, we are much better at manufacturing those things, making those things, so at the end of the war, we become more self-sufficient, self-reliant. We don't have to rely on Britain as much, which we're going to see in the next unit. It kind of allows our country to expand very rapidly. Um, so yeah, those are all the terms on your study guide. Let's quickly go over some of the B-level questions. Um, as always, we've pretty much talked about a lot of these uh, B-level questions. 
Um, why do you think so many merchants and manufacturers were Federalists? Yeah, think about what they wanted to do. The British, the Federalists wanted to trade with the British. They wanted to not go against the British. And the Democratic Republicans wanted to go against the British in the French Revolution. So if we went against the British, we wouldn't be able to trade. And if you're a manufacturer, if you can't trade, you can't make money. So the Federalists, would mo the Federalists didn't want to go to war with the British, So, uh, like in the early goings. So that's why more manufacturers and merchants were Federalists. Political traditions and um, tensions first appeared in the early years of the New Republic. The traditions part is like George Washington stuff, like what he did, Mr. President, President's Cabinet, all that kind of stuff. And the tensions would be kind of the arguments over um, loose and strict interpretation of the Constitution, uh, stuff that we talked a lot about just now. How was the presidential election of 18, oh, 1800 resolved? That's the one that was a tie, and uh, House of Representatives had to vote a whole bunch of times. Why did Washington impose political parties? Talked about that a little bit, page 328. Uh, he was just worried that it would form into two groups, and they would never, ever get anything done. How did Hamilton and Jefferson differ on their interpretation of the Constitution? That is, exa that is a question perfectly suited to explain the differences between strict and loose interpretation of the Constitution, using examples like the National Bank um, and things like that. What issues divided Americans during Adams' presidency? This would be the XYZ affair, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, look those up, figure out what people liked them, why they liked them, what people didn't like them. Whatever. In what ways did Federalists and Democratic Republicans differ? That'd be that chart on page 329. Talk a little bit about the strict and loose interpretation of the Constitution, but also talk about who the leaders were, who, um, what type of person most likely would be in it, uh, what regions they're mostly located, what financial problems face the new nation, um, war debt, war debt, war debt, a whole bunch of it, and then also explain Hamilton's plan with tariffs and... Yeah, why did events in Europe create problems for America? As, I mean, think about simply the fact that Britain and France start fighting. That pulls us in, and why does it pull us in? Um, it has to do with all the trading that we do with them. I mean, we can't not we can't we can't not be involved with them um, with trading, and then you know it just doesn't work out. So. How might the theory of states' rights undermine the federal government? States' rights, as remember, is where states have the right to overturn, nullify, to declare a law of the national government unconstitutional, or they're just not going to follow it. So uh, how could that undermine, which means like go against or work against the power of the national government? Um, so yeah, okay, so that's basically unit six. Uh, the test will be tomorrow. There will be a study session if you have questions and stuff. You can throw them up on Twitter and Facebook. Um, feel free to ask anything about anything, um, unit six-wise. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So just watch this video again, study, you know, read over your study guide, read over your notes, look in the book, look over your C-level stuff, and uh, you'll be fine. So... Uh, yeah, good luck.